we see a lot of variation, but kind of almost like, you know, unbelievably, but paradoxically, there's not that much genetic variation between us compared especially to other species. And we're at least 99.9% .9 similar one individual to another. Um, so why is that so? Why that kind of a seeming, that paradox? And that paradox is because we're a pretty young species. We also may have experienced some bottlenecks in human evolution. So there's not much variation to begin with. And secondly, like other species, uh, mountain gorillas, gorillas for instance, uh, two different groups of mountain gorillas which may occupy different sides of a mountain, those mountain gorillas may be reproductively isolated, that they don't mix anymore. And so that mixing makes them genetically more different. Humans are a global species, but we have no global boundaries to our mixing. So there is not as strong a variation from place to place as there is in, say, those mountain gorillas that live very close to each other. And rather, most variation, almost all variation, occurs within a group, even a group of, of individuals from Oslo, Norway. What's interesting is we do see phenotypic variation, variation that physically we can see, variation in heights and weights and skin textures and colors and eye colors and the way our ears look and our mouths and our noses. And those things tend to vary geographically, mostly based on adaptation to different climates. However, they're not a good representation of overall variation, which is much more similar individual to individual and isn't at all affected by local variation and climate. Is there a scientific consensus on whether or not race exists or not as a biological entity? This is maybe the most interesting question I could imagine. And well, there should be a scientific consensus, but I, th and I think we may be approaching that. We're definitely not approaching a social consensus about that question. To continue to believe in race abets racism and continues to, you know, in, and falsely lets people think that racial inequalities are justified naturally, and they're not. They're social, they're political and they're based on an idea that should be considered extinct at this point. People like me work with DNA samples and usually we go to a freezer and we take a box and the samples of people from a certain part of the world and of course what, what we get is a biological result. A few years ago I went to Easter Island for the first time and I'd worked on the DNA of Easter Islanders for over 20 years. And I was with a group of colleagues who had looked at individual people and they had their DNA typed in a very high resolution way, which allowed to find out about ancestry for every person. For a very long time, people have agreed that the Easter Islanders came from Polynesia. So they came from the, from the Western part, from Asia. But Thor Heyerdahl had the idea that maybe some of the people in Easter Island came from South America. Now, using just uh, blood groups, there wasn't sufficient information to tell where people came from. But we know so much about the different parts of the genome that come from different continents that we can tell whether any person in Easter Island what part of the ancestry is from South America, what part of the ancestry is from Europe, what part of the ancestry is from Polynesia. And one evening we gave people their individual results back. And people were so excited about this. I mean, one lady was 100% European, another person was 100% from somewhere else, but there were people there who had a little bit of Polynesian ancestry. And they were hugely excited. That island was discovered by Europeans 
in the 18th century. And little by little, the, the, the people living there were killed by outright murder or by infectious diseases, or, or they left because life became in intolerable to the point that there was nothing left there. So if somebody from Easter Island can look at their DNA and say, I have 12% of Polynesian DNA left, that for them is a symbol that despite all this horrible history, something there matters. So I think for the first time, it was like a, a little revolution in my head, because before that I thought, oh, DNA doesn't really matter, it's inside. We, we, our identity is to do with our language and our food and our family. But for these people, the symbolic value of knowing that a little bit in their DNA was Polynesian was just like, oh, you know, I, I have rediscovered who I am. So I think the symbolic value of DNA typing is very great. But I think we have to understand it in the context of these centuries of horrible history. And of Easter Island was a lab for, for Western sci scientists. You know, people went, collected blood samples every five years, every 10 years. And the Easter Islanders were always obliging. We have to be polite to these foreigners. So here is a, a sample of blood. But I think it's time that we realize that human beings are not guinea pigs and they have also some interest in their ancestry and it's not them and us, it, it's, it's us, it's only us and I think we've got a duty to, to recognize that and not just write about people from certain parts of the world as if they were some exotic species. So. Uh the first thing to say about gen human genetic diversity is that there isn't very much of it. So there's very low genetic diversity in humans compared with sort of comparable species. So we are greater than, all of us greater than 99% similar in our DNA sequences. Um, so the evidence points to our origin as a species in Africa, Homo sapiens, and then the migration out of Africa followed by some mixture with archaic species, including Neanderthals, and then spreading into the old world by about 40,000 years ago, and then subsequent movements into other parts of the world, including the Americas. If you were to sample um, regularly, as if you were to walk across the landscape, and then every 10 kilometers you met someone and you um, asked them if they would give you a DNA sample, and they did, and you kept doing that, and then at the end of your journey you'd wandered across the whole world. I think what you would see is a gradient of diversity um, that captures um, the people who live in the world today. And that gradient has within it, as I've said, a signal of migration, early migration um, out of Africa within it. So scientists are people with political views as well, just like everybody else. And when a scientist has a particular view about the world, then as most of us do, then it can't help but influence the way that we frame and discuss our conclusions in terms of population differences. In the 1990s there was a project called the Human Genome Diversity Project and it grew out of the Human Genome Project which was the project to sequence the human genome which was announced by Clinton and Blair in, in 2000. And this was quite an idealistic project, I mean it hoped to describe normal variation in human populations and actually to contribute to the elimination of racism and the appreciation of human diversity. But there was a discussion at the beginning about how they should sample populations and people around the world. And one person, Alan Wilson, uh, who is the father of the subject of molecular evolution and had studied non-human animals quite a lot, said, well, we should sample on a grid pattern. We should do this business of sampling every few kilometers, regardless of what we our prior expectations are about difference. We should just sample in a regular pattern across the world. And there was a counter argument from people with a basis in anthropology who had been classifying people by their uh, culture in the past, by their languages, and were aware of particular groups of interest to them who were often um, small in population number and sometimes threatened by extinction.
And they said, no, we come up with a list of our favorite populations and we should sample them. Um, and that view prevailed. And so it led to a very patchy sampling, a very non-uniform sampling of people from around the world. It led to a bias towards the sampling of population isolates. So people who it was known had been separated from other populations, either through linguistic or cultural difference or ge through geographical uh, difference. And the out outcome of that was that the picture of genetic diversity that we got was not this gradient. It was rather more a clustered picture. And that that clustered picture of diversity has been used by people with a racist agenda to support the idea that there are, in some sense, racial stocks of humans that differ from each other. But when you consider um, other data in which this sampling is not done in that way, then those clusters uh, dissipate into a more of a gradient picture. So I think that that project, the way it was designed, had some unfortunate features. So race is one of these categories that was dressed up um, and made legitimate by the discipline of anthropology. So when you look at the late 19th, early 20th century, part of what anthropology did was try to take this vernacular and folk category and give it sort of academic, intellectual, and scientific credibility um, in ways that now we look back in a very critical manner and say, well, clearly they were trucking in their own ethno ethnocentric assumptions and pretending, and pretending might feel pointed, um, but I think it's important for us to recognize that even though we know science is the key to understanding how our world works, scientists are still cultural beings. And so they truck into their laboratories, into their scientific discussions, some of their own cultural presuppositions as well. And race was one of these ideas, one of these ideological commitments that scientists have had a hard time shaking, even at their best, even when they're trying as critically and objectively as possible. So when I, when I think about how we need to address in the contemporary moment, I think it's important to recognize that for most anthropologists now, we've learned from the mistakes of anthropologists of yore. We know race isn't biologically real in the ways we once imagined it to be. And we all offer up this notion of social construction as a way to talk about race and its import, right? So we say race isn't biologically real. It's something that we've concocted. We've agreed to think about it as a way to sort of categorize human beings. But it's a way to categorize human beings that still imagines itself to be moored in biology, in genetics, in the body even though it's really wholly a political category. And so social construction says, let's highlight the constructedness, the artificiality of race and convince people, disabuse people of their assumptions about race's link to actual biological differences between and among groups. But what we have to remember is, if we've created race, what we've concocted is almost like a Frankensteinian monster that feels so powerful and so menacing and so terrifying that now it seems to control us. Now it seems to lord itself, lord itself over us. And there's a version of our relationship to this category we created that almost feels like it has us shackled, it has us confined. And so the key is how do we reimagine social connection and possibility without the worst versions of our commitments to racial difference, which always truck in notions of racial hierarchy too. Um, and so we assume race is a powerful category, not just because it tells us who peoples are, but we also then assume what people are, what their identities are, then presupposes things about what they do, either what they should do, what their natural capacities are. And those links are always, for us, concoctions. There are attempts to create ties between practice and identity that aren't just intrinsically there in the world, but we can put them together, often in service to our own political goals. So we have to do more, I would argue, as anthropologists than just convince people race is a social construct. We have to explain to them how and why it's an answer, we think, to some of our most profound, even existential fears about difference. And how do we negotiate those fears in ways that don't just scapegoat some other community along racialist lines? Uh, even though I studied transnational adoption, but my real interest is to study the construction of nationhood uh, in the Norwegian context, then it's Norwegian-ness. Um, so I want to find out uh, when a person looks different but grow up 
in Norway. I mean, these transnational adoptees, and also they were not born in Norway. So there are some differences that might be relevant to their Norwegian identity. So how do they think about it, and what do they do if these re- if these differences are relevant? Um. In the studies of the nation and the nationhood, we talk about different kinds of、uh, nationhood. The one is civic, and the other is ethnic. The civic means that you need to have a Norwegian passport to be considered as Norwegian. Ethnic means much more. We we know that in Norway, it's not enough to only have a Norwegian passport. You have to, in a way, argue for you have a cultural.、Uh, Cultural belonging and also the ancestry is very important. The my informants when they told me when I'm in India, my home country, other people look upon me as whites. Then what does this mean? It simply means that you are not one of us, even though you are adopted from India, but you grew up in a Western country. You have Western parents, so you are in a privileged position. So I think, in fact, I have、uh, material to show that whiteness is something you can perform.、Um, for example, through your postures and through your ways of being. My informants talk about the hairstyle and how they walk and how they talk、uh, as a female in a public place, and all these things can indicate that they are not. Migrants, but they they grew up in Norway. They are Norwegians. They are in a privileged position. Race as a biological category does not exist,、um, but the race as a concept、um, uh, that help us to perceive others and perceive ourselves do exist. And I think in the in Norway, as in other Nordic countries, there is a silent articulation of race, or I would say, or there has been a silent articulation of race.、Um, but I also, what I've noticed, of course, they are more and more open to talk about race, but still there is a general resistance. People do not feel comfortable to talk about the race.、Um, of course, we do not n- need race. But one problem is if you do not、um, recognize、uh, the race and the race relevance in our daily life, then it's very difficult to talk about the racism.